Hi everyone, um, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Libby, and I'm the Fundraising and Communications Officer here at Anticure, and I'll be hosting today's webinar on patient engagement in medical research. This is the fifth of the six, uh, six in our Explained webinar series, the aim of which is to give you, um, Reddy's patient groups and advocates, the opportunity to learn from experts in the field and other patient groups in the hope that um, this will help you to improve your patient support and enable you to advocate for patients in a variety of different ways. The webinar series is sponsored by Camradis, who would like to thank for their support. But please note that they do not have any control over the webinar content. Today's webinar specifically will introduce you how, to, how patient groups can direct medical research and involve patients in it. We'll be listening to two very interesting half-hour presentations. Firstly, Julian Eisler from Dravitz Syndrome European Federation will talk about when patients take the lead and direct research themselves. He'll be shortly followed by Anna Louise Smith from Parkinson's UK, who will talk about a number of programmes they have to involve patients in research. We'll then have half an hour for questions at the end. To ask a question, all you have to do is type it into the question box in the control panel. I will receive the questions after you submit them and I will be able to ask it to the, sp uh, to the speakers either directly after their talk or in the question and answer session at the end, depending on the time available. So it'd be great if, as you're sort of listening along, um, you think about anything extra you'd like to know for your patient group, no matter how silly you think it might be. We really do want you to come away with a good understanding of the topic in hand, and this is a great opportunity for you to learn some, from some very experienced speakers, so please do ask away. The webinar will be recorded, so don't worry if you miss anything. You can also tweet about the webinar using the hashtag explainedwebinar. Cool, so I'll just quickly introduce our speakers for today and their backgrounds. Julian Eisler is the Founder, Chairman and Director of Technology and Innovation at the European Dravitz Syndrome Federation, a European organisation for patients, of patients with Dravitz Syndrome. He set up the organisation after his son was diagnosed with the condition. Julian is also a software engineer by training, representative on the Orphan Drugs Committee at the EMA, part of the Therapeutic Advisory Group for Eurydice, and an ambassador of the Spanish Red Diseases Federation. We are very grateful to him for joining us today. Our second speaker, Anna Louise Smith, manages the Research Support Network at Parkinson's UK, an online network for people to connect and have their say in Parkinson's research. The network has grown from 700 members when Anna joined in 2013 to 3,300 plus it is today, which is a great achievement. She also manages the team's volunteer programme and develops local Parkinson's research interest groups to bring together people affected by Parkinson's with researchers in local regions. Huge thanks to both our speakers for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to switch over to Julian, who is going to introduce his work in directing research. So, yeah, I work in Microsoft as in Microsoft Consulting Services. This is like the, you know, the conflict of interest declaration, but uh, my work in Microsoft is not related to health and it's not related to rare diseases and it's not really related to science, right? Um, on top of this, I'm also I'm also the, 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 the chairman of the Dravet European, uh, Dravet Europe, uh, European Federation. I'm also a member of the Therapeutic uh, Action Group from Neurordis, uh, delegate of the European Medicine Agency, uh, member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the CBRR, the Spanish, the Spanish Network uh, for Research on Rare Diseases. Uh, the people say I'm some kind of superhero, but I, I, I prefer to say that the, rare disease, that, that the rare diseases are giving superpowers to people, and I guess they are representatives on the attendees of this webinar that they have superpowers as well. The reason of these superpowers is because of, of Sergio. Sergio is, is one of my sons and he has Dravet syndrome. When Sergio was diagnosed, the, first, the, the only one word I remember very well was catastrophic because the neurologist said to me your son has a catastrophic encephalopathy. If you look for the definition of catastrophe, yeah, it's very bad, right? And in fact, for Dravet syndrome, it's very bad as well, because the, the, defini the phenotype for Dravet syndrome is, is, is very severe in terms of the clinical uh, symptoms 
and the derived patients have. Um, the most the more the most characteristic uh, clinical symptoms are seizures, uh, epileptic epileptic crisis. I have a video of a seizure, but I guess I won't be able to you know um, roll out the, the video in the webinar. So I don't know if you guys can see the video, but anyway, if you are not familiar with seizures, seizures are very dramatic for the families. And in Dravet syndrome, if you are lucky, you can have three or four of these seizures by, by month. If you are not lucky, you can have 20 or 30 of these seizures by day. So with this difficult situation, we started the Dravet Syndrome Foundation uh, seven years ago in Spain uh, with other families in order to, you know, look for, for a dream. Our dream was to find new therapies, new treatments for Dravet Syndrome. And we use this, the, 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 the symbol of shooting to the moon, like the, the, the representation of what, what we wanted to do, because, you know, finding treatments for rare diseases is super hard and it's, it's really difficult. And we started to do a lot of activities in, in the field of patients community. So we rapidly, we are starting to consider ourselves in patients rather than patients. In patients in the mean of we are not willing to wait. We want to start to do things to make sure things are changing. And because our condition is a neurological condition, we, you know, started to, to work with the doctor community as most of patients, communi uh, patient organization, but we quickly jumped into very sophisticated projects. For example, we implemented a genetic text program that is running right now for all worldwide patient community. We move the genetic uh, facilities into NGS, next generation sequencing technology. Um, we started to work on rat discovery and repurposing for drugs. Uh, we started to work with uh, scientific people to understand the physiopathology of rabbit. We support the industry on clinical trials. We started to work with uh, regulators and governments. We are starting to think how the regional governments are going to pay drugs for Dravet because finding a drug is not enough. You have to make sure in Europe that your government is willing to pay the drug you are finding. And also we created a knowledge network with, with other patients community, doctors and researchers. We demonstrate the impact of Dravet in the in the society in order to create the evidence for for payment for new drugs, and we also did a lot of awareness activity to to illustrate to the doctor, a patient, and, and other individuals what Dravet is and how we can add on Dravet. And at the same time, we are taking care of our uh, families as well and patients. But some years ago, I received this mail from uh, Nancy from Urordis inviting me to the Urordis Summer School. And this event really changed my life because during this event, Urordis is organizing training for patients. It's a very intensive training. Next year, uh, we are going to have the next uh, Summer School. It's every, every year in June. And if you are there, you will be with so many other patients from different conditions, and you will be attending very intensive training on regulatory clinical trials, uh, ethicals, a lot of stuff, super interesting. And when I finish my training, I come back to, to Madrid, and in, in a couple of weeks, I receive one call from one of the ladies on this picture is Maria Mavris. Maria is right now a special rep representative at IMA, at the European Medicine Agency. And Maria suggests me a very interesting idea of, you know, joining the Orphan Drug Committee as observer to be able to know what's going on there and check if this activity will be interesting for me. 
So I say yes, and I I I went to London to, uh, for the next meeting at the IMA. Uh, the the Orphan Drug Committee is meeting uh, every month, and they usually is two three days of very intensive meeting uh, discussing new drugs for for rare diseases. Um, when you are going to London to the IMA, something you realize is that the place is very impressive. The IMA is located in the in the financial district in Canary Wharf in London, and you know, with all the all the banks and all the institutions uh, being there, and the atmosphere of the scientific committee at the IMA is quite impressive as well. You are in a meeting room like this with very important people, most of them experts from different uh, countries of the European European Union. But they was very lucky because in the first time I attend this meeting, the, the committee was discussing uh, a protocol assistant for a new drug for Dravet. It was the first time in 10 years that they were uh, discussing a new drug for Dravet. And I was very lucky in a sense that they was there, you know, as, a, as an expert for the condition. Um, and I was lucky as well because the, 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 the product coordinator for this product and this is the lady at the right, is Chastin from Sweden. Chastin asked me to participate in the discussion as, a, as an expert, right? This is something IMA is doing quite often. They are inviting uh, experts from the different conditions to provide the insights from patients' perspective. And I was lucky because I was there and Chastin was willing to engage me on the discussion. The work to be done was complex because the work was part of scientific advice. It's called protocol assistant. And in protocol assistant, when you have the orphan drug, orphan drug designation, you can ask questions to the uh, scientific committees. And the most typical question you ask is the design you are doing for the clinical trial you are planning to do will be uh, enough to demonstrate efficacy for the drug. Um, and this is quite important because based on the design of the clinical trial, the clinical trial is considering the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion and inclusion criteria determine the, the set up the people going to be enrolled on the clinical trial and the people going to be excluded from the clinical trial. And you know that clinical trials are, you know, one of the most, uh, you know, the earliest, the earliest steps in order to get access to new drugs. So they are very important for patients with rare diseases. The question for the committee to me was quite simple, right? The question was, um, do you know how many patients of Europe are taking this drug? This drug right now is important for Dravet because it's the only one drug with uh, marketing authorization. So it's the drug that has been, uh, who has been approved for Dravet syndrome right now with different level of efficacy, right? The, the drug is not really uh, solvent Dravet problem, but it will help some patients. And the point from uh, the company was that the number of people taking this drug was very low, so it was not sense uh, to include the drug in the clinical trial design. Um, but when the, the, the scientific committee asked me this simple question, the, the question was very simple is, how many patients are taking these drugs? And what's the distribution of drugs in the drug European uh, population? The question was simple, but I didn't have any clue because we didn't have a registry and we didn't have this information at the European level. Because the problem we, we, we had is that this information right now is in, you know, in clinical records. And in our condition, most of the information the patients have is in papers. It's not digital. So it's not possible to, to reply or to answer these kind of questions in a very fast way. So we thought, okay, we don't have these numbers, but 
What about if we collect the numbers and we come back in a couple of weeks with more solid data? And this is exactly what we did. We did a survey monkey, you know, survey monkey is super important for science <laughs> right now. And we collect data for 274 patients in just one week. And in fact, this exercise was the most comprehensive study about the European population because with the power of our community, we were able to collect data for much more patients than any doctor in the history of Dravet. We published the data. Uh, the publication of this data really changed the design of the clinical study. At the end, the company realized the importance of including Stipental on this, on the design of the clinical trial. And some, after some months, when the clinical trial started and, you know, the, the, the program to analyze the study of the, the efficacy of this drug started, uh, one of the mothers in the U.S. sent me this, uh, this, this chart with the evolution of the, of the seizures for her son. And the, the, the evolution is quite, is quite good. As you can see, then this patient was clearly responding to the drug. And, you know, the feeling of uh, doing things well was extremely important because, of the, because with the work with this, providing the right data to the, to the IMA, to a scientific committee, we changed the design of the clinical trial, and because of the change of the clinical trial, the patients uh, found benefit because of that. And this is a good example of how patients can influence the way that clinical trials are designed and how uh, the patients can, be, uh, can find some benefit because of that. So, takeaways from you, uh, and I guess it's going to be, it, they're going to be relevant uh, for, for your organization, so for the activities you are doing as well. Uh, when you are working in, in a patient organization, you really need to understand how the industry is working and how the industry is considering rare diseases to make business focus. Right now, uh, if you think how the industry analyzes rare diseases, you can, you know, uh, draw the, the different scenarios where when you have science and knowledge about the disease in one uh, age and you have business in terms of low, less or, or more profitable for the company. If you have a low profit and you know high knowledge, you have the generics and some companies can, are going into this market because you know it's a, it's a valid business model. For, but for most of the companies, the best scenario is when you have high profits and the knowledge is high, for sure. But in rare diseases, we have also the scenario where the, the companies can be opportunistic and do repurposing. The knowledge is low about the disease or the drug. It's, they are just using from different indication, but the profit is high. And also we have the scenarios with, where the, the knowledge is low and the profit is low as well. Most of the companies are working on this scenario. So think about where you are and where your rare disease is and think how you want to move the, the scenarios into the, the ideal scenarios. High profit and high knowledge. Because the issue is rare diseases, we are all around. There are rare diseases with high knowledge and high profit, and there are rare diseases with less uh, profit or low profit and not enough knowledge. And based on that, you need to design your strategy because definitely you want to move here. Because the, if you are here, you will capture the interest of the industry on your disease. And at the end, it's the industry who has to produce new drugs for your condition. That is enough because, you know, we have 7,000 rare diseases. Maybe we have more, we don't know. But we don't have too many treatments. In the IRDIC initiative, the goal is to have 200 treatments in 2020. We are in a very good shape. We, go, we are going to beat this goal. But the problem is 
is not enough for the all the rare diseases we have because um, we will have to multiply by 35 the total uh, drugs available we have right now for rare diseases it's like an impossible mission if we are continue doing things on the same way and at the same time the number of rare diseases is increasing because of genetics the 7,000 rare diseases will be uh, will be more in the next years and the, the medical knowledge is increasing super fast as well right so the question is, I'm not sure if we will be able to catch uh, the 7,000 um, uh, rare diseases with the, with the same mechanisms we are using right now. Because the issue is, you as a patient organization, where do you think you can create more impact? In profit or in knowledge? M my suggestion will be invest in knowledge. Right, because the the profit access is much is less actionable than the knowledge. In knowledge, you can create this. Because for the future, if we move into the precision medicine, and this is the definition of precision medicine in NIH, precision medicine is defined is defined uh, like the knowledge we have about the condition, the knowledge we have about the genes, the knowledge we have about the environment and the lifestyle. And I want to add as well the medical treatment. This is quite important as well. So in, investing in knowledge, investing in knowledge about genes, environment, medical treatment is super important to create this kind of disruption and make sure we multiply the number of new drugs we have for rare diseases. And everything is changing. This is uh, a medical, this is a doctor from the US called Eric Topol. Eric Topol wrote a very nice book some years ago called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And Eric started to, you know, visualize how things are changing in the clinical space, how we are moving from population based initiatives into uh, precision medicine how we are moving from data created by doctors to data created by everyone and how the technology is really supporting this new way of doing medicine and right now he has a new book called, called the patient will see you now in and is the opposite when the doctors say i'm going to visit patients Right now, the approach is, well, the patients are seeing doctors, right? And this is particularly relevant in rare diseases, right? Uh, another takeaway is, think about healthcare can be right now more uh, information problem. Because if you think how knowledge is produced, all, all is about how we manage information medical information, basic information, information about treatments, you know. And the way we are collecting this information can change the outcome of the disease as well. Uh, this is one initiative that the Rabbit Syndrome Foundation in Spain is running right now in, to understand the, 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 the rabbit population worldwide. They have this tool that we created some years ago in order to understand real, in real time the, the situation of the traveled population. And the question from the EMA right now is something that we will be able to answer uh, immediately because they have real time data. And this is exactly where everybody will be, you know, in some years, right? So, uh, just to, to finish my presentation, and um, yeah, we did a lot of activities, but you know, uh, you have to do with passion and emotion. The business we are <laughs> we are doing, you know, is purely emotional as well because we are dealing with our children in most of our situation, our patients, and you need to combine knowledge, technology, and emotions as well. This is quite important because all the work I presented here has been possible from my personal situation because 
uh, you know, I've been dealing with medical uh, people. I've been I've been living in, in intensive care units several nights, and because of this pain, we realize what is needed to change. And from this, I want to recognize the the, the work that our doctors and the people working in hospital, taking care of our patients, are doing every day, every night. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. The idea of today is, you know, identify more superheroes, identify people with more superpowers, and thank you so much for you know, the work you guys are doing on the on the field of rare diseases. Great, thank you, Julian. And um, that was a really interesting and engaging um, talk. And um, I think you're you're totally right that um, in emphasising how important knowledge is for sort of um, driving forward research. Um, and there are, there are different ways that patient groups can and sort of um, create knowledge for this purpose. Um, that's really good. Um, so now we're going to switch over to um, Anna Louise um, Smith from Parkinson's UK, who's going to talk about involving patients in research. Uh, first, I just want to say, Julian, that was an amazing talk. It was so um, inspirational on so many levels, and it's uh, it's it's incredible what you've achieved, and um, it's it, it's precisely the sort of involvement that we're really uh, championing here at uh, Parkinson's UK. So thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm. Um, Hello, I'm Anna Louise Smith. I'm the Research Support Network Manager at Parkinson's UK. Uh, we have a patient and public involvement program, which I've been asked to talk to you about today. So, um, Parkinson's UK, we are the largest member-led charitable funder of Parkinson's research in Europe. And so far, we've invested over 80 million pounds in groundbreaking research. So we're averaging at around five to six million pounds per year. Uh, so yeah, over the past five years, that's equaled around 25 million. And as I say, we're a member-led organization, so it's really important that we justify our spend and that we involve them in every stage of the process. So we are working on ensuring that our research program is shaped by and accountable to people. So I'm going to be talking to you about our uh, grants funding program and how, how, they, uh, how people help us with that. And uh, we need to give people affected by Parkinson's the opportunity to have their say in research. So I'll be covering uh, how we're linking people with researchers. And we also need to support the Parkinson's research community, so the researchers themselves, to work in partnership with patients, carers, and, and family members, as, as Julian was describing. So the Research Support Network, the, the network that I manage, we're an online network. Um, it says here 3,000 people. It's, it's growing phenomenally uh, every day. So we're now up to 3,371 at my last count. Um, we are an online network. We email our members uh, usually weekly. And the, the network consists of predominantly people affected by Parkinson's. Uh, as well as their family members, carers, and friends. That's that's pretty much 90% of the network. We are getting picked up by uh, researchers more and more, uh, and people with with a general interest in Parkinson's research. And we broadcast opportunities to the network. So initially, we'll be looking at um, we we share news and uh, information about events, and so people connect with us at a, a top line level. But then once they see there's other sorts of opportunities we offer, people tend to get more and more involved and mobilized to, to take it further. So um, a good example of how an organization, how a charity can uh, make the first step towards uh, patient and public involvement is um, the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership, which you may have heard of. Parkinson's UK took part in this uh, in 2013. And we asked people affected by Parkinson's, as well as health and social care professionals, to help us to tell us what their research priority areas were for improving everyday life with Parkinson's. So we know everyone wants a cure. That's a given. That's a definite um, area that, that we will pursue. But we're also aware that 
people are living with, with these conditions every single day and they need uh, research and assistance in, in dealing with that. So this is what this project's about. What would improve everyday life with um, the condition that you're, you're researching? In our case, Parkinson's. And so after uh, everybody told us, over a thousand people participated and the top 10 came out of that. You can see those um, listed on the right hand side of the screen. Things like balance and fall, stress and anxiety, sleep problems, dexterity problems, urinary problems, things that you might not associate with Parkinson's and this is why it's so important to ask people affected by the condition to tell you what they want to research because it may not be the most obvious but it could be the thing that is really making life the most difficult. And so these results are now being used to inform and guide and really drive um, our, our research program. Um, as I said before, the, the cure is definitely the big one and, and there will always be money put towards that. But uh, in our grants um, process, the um, assessors are aware of these as being priorities for our patient um, community and so that, that is considered. So I'll talk about what we're doing internally and starting with the involvement in our grants program because this is pretty much where um, where Parkinson's UK kind of nailed it initially with, with patient and public involvement. As we're a member-led organization, this, this, is, um, this is where we started. So I'll talk you through the system, the, the grant application process. Researchers come to us, they submit their applications via our online grants management system and then simultaneously these uh, applications are reviewed. On the one hand we have scientific peers who are looking at the scientific merit of each application but at the same time we have lay grant reviewers reviewing the applications and these are predominantly people affected by Parkinson's as well as um, family members, people who have a, con a connection to Parkinson's. So when I say people affected by Parkinson's, that is patients, family, carers, etc. So once they are um, reviewed by both the peers and the lay grant reviewers, the applications are shortlisted based on the combined scores. The unsuccessful applicants will receive feedback and that's feedback both from the lay grant reviewers and the scientific peers, which is really useful for them if they want to then reapply or apply somewhere else and the ones that are shortlisted are presented to the grants assessment panels. So the lay grant reviewers, they are, um, we have a, a, a stable you might say, uh, we have over 100, over 100 people now affected by Parkinson's and they review all the applications that we receive. And when I say they review all of them, I don't mean all 100 review every single application. Um, we broadcast uh, to the lay grant reviewers when we get applications in and uh, generally five to six uh, lay grant reviewers are selected per application. Uh, as I said before, the peer reviewers will review the scientific quality and the relevance and the merit of the application. And so what you might ask, do we ask our lay grant reviewers to comment on? They, their perspective is incredibly important to, to give us a, a reality check as to what the importance of the research is to the patient population. So they're looking at the importance of it, they're looking at whether the question is meaningful and relevant to them. They look at the potential benefits of the project and whether or not the researchers have explained that sufficiently. They're looking at the practicalities of the study design and I think Julian sort of mentioned this as well. People affected by Parkinson's can have a real impact on making sure that study design is A, feasible and B, if it's not uh, helping that to, to be so and I'll, I'll go into that a bit further later on. They can also comment on whether or not patient and public involvement is evident, is, is, is uh, described in the research application. Has it already been utilised in getting the application together uh, or are they going to be involving people throughout the research project? And they also look at the communication in the lay summary, making sure it is actually lay. Finally, they um, can highlight if there's anything within the application um, in, the lay, in the plain English summary that could be improved. So getting drilling down, reading the plain English summary. This is really important because more and more researchers are going to have to 
explain themselves in, in terms that are understandable and accessible if they want to receive funding. Um, so yes, the, the lay grant reviewers look at whether the language is understandable, whether the purpose of the research is clear, has the background been summarized adequately, you know, why are they doing what they're doing, and are the scientific terms and jargon well explained, because we all know that scientists do have their own language and it's really important that if they're going to um, be sharing this uh, beyond their own circle that, that they do it effectively and who better than people in the patient population and their family and carers who, who they are most interested in in the work that's being done so they're probably the best people to, to ask to, to help with that. So our grant assessment panels uh, each consist of 30 to 40 uh, leading scientists, peers in, in, the, uh, in, in the Parkinson's arena. And this has been going on since 2002 that we have um, had the lay grant reviewers represented by lay review coordinators who collect up all of the uh, comments from the lay grant reviewers and they are present at the assessment panels so that we have that uh, representation in the room of people affected by Parkinson's. The panel then makes recommendations of funding to the Chief Executive and the Board of Trustees. So now I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing externally. That was our internal grants program, but for the last uh, three years I've been working closely with the patient public involvement team. Um, when I say team, there are, there are two of them and one of me, but we've been working really hard to, uh, to make sure that we're improving the patient public involvement uh, uh, program and, and helping others to do it as well. So we've worked really hard to, to, to make it as simple as possible and to create resources that are accessible. So in a nutshell, patient and public involvement is when research is carried out with or by patients and family members, etc., rather than to or about them. And it's important because we want researchers to work in partnership with people as much as possible because what comes out of that is much higher quality, more relevant research that essentially for, for researchers is more fundable uh, but it's important as I say to the people affected by Parkinson's that it's going to, to be felt by the people who need it most. And it's not just us that are insisting on patient public involvement. Um, the Wellcome Trust, NIHR and MRC are all asking researchers to improve the way they work with patients and carers and family members because it is better quality. So let's break it down. Well, I said before that there's a distinction between involvement and participation and engagement. So involvement is working in partnership. I can't stress that enough. It is actually working alongside people affected by the condition that you're researching to plan, design, manage, evaluate and disseminate research. Of course it doesn't have to involve every single one of those, it could be one or two, but it, that involvement is, 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 is a joint venture. Participation, it's equally important but it's not involvement. It's getting patients and carers to take part in the research. The research is being done to them or extracting data from them. And engagement, again, is incredibly important, especially if you're seeking funding or if you're wanting to spread the word about the amazing research that you have uh, done or funded, and that is telling people about the research. You might get feedback, but the feedback isn't going to affect the research that's already been done. So let's play a little game. Um, if you could listen or read this uh, explanation and then write down in the chat box um, whether you think it's involvement, participation or engagement, that would be great and then Libby uh, can uh, let us know what, what kind of consensus we've got. So, a researcher is holding an open day and inviting members of the public to attend and hear about the research going on at the university. There's a feedback box where members of the public can share their thoughts about the talks and the day overall. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to write your answer and then Libby if you could tell us what the consensus is please. Sure, I'll just give people a couple of seconds. Um, cool, so most people are saying engagement. There's a couple of participations there as well. Okay, well, the 
Engagements are correct. Well done. I've got a couple more of these, so I'll, I'll go on to the next one. But yes, that is engagement because the talk is being is done about something that's already happened, and the feedback box is great, but it's not actually going to to change that uh, bit of engagement. Could do for later engagement activities, but that's essentially engagement. So this one, a research group is going to talk at an international patient conference about a new stem cell treatment for Parkinson's disease. They meet with group, a group of patients and carers to listen to and comment on the presentation before the conference. What do you think that might be? Um, so we've got most people saying involvement with yeah. a couple more participation. Mm -hmm. that, that is actually involvement. That's just an example of involvement. There are so many different ways you can do it, but that is uh, consulting with patients and carers. And goodness me, the amount of researchers that I uh, come across who have done this and found that it has increased the, um, the listenability of their, <laughs> their, their talks. It's, it's a really, really uh, valuable thing to do. And the last one is a researcher sends patients enrolled in a cohort study a link to an online portal that allows the researchers to track and monitor patient symptoms. What do we think that is? Oh. Um, we've got uh, a very strong participation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your powers of elimination are excellent, everybody. <laughs> yes, that is participation <laughs> because the patients are providing data about themselves, and that is what's being uh, analysed. So there are various. Um, ways that people can be involved in the research cycle. This is, again, we've, we've done a lot of work to try and make things as simple as possible when we're talking about this. So this is a basic research cycle, starting with identifying and prioritizing the research question. And patients can absolutely uh, be involved in this, as can family members and, and carers. What is the question? Is it relevant? Is it a priority? Then going on to designing um, the, the, the research project. Especially when you're looking at clinical research, if you're involving people, if you're needing to um, to to get participants to do something, to to come in, to attend lab visits, to give blood samples, whatever, you're going to want to involve people with the condition because they will know what is feasible or not, um, and and. The work that we've done has, has really um, helped certain researchers who will have potentially a fantastic idea uh, on paper, science-wise. So I'll give you an example. We had um, a researcher who, who asked for patient public involvement uh, help. We got together a focus group and he explained his project where he wanted to uh, invite people to come in off medication for 24 hours to get into an MRI scanner and stay in there for a good hour and then potentially do it again in the afternoon they would have had to have been there for hours off medication and the patient public involvement volunteers understandably blew all sorts of holes in that and and and, and let him know in, in the nicest possible way why that wasn't possible now the worst case scenario there would be that that went through and that got funded and then fell down at that next hurdle. So it would have been a waste of money, a waste of time, and a waste of a really good idea that could and was tweaked to, um, to, to be more feasible. Then through to commissioning, um, again, patient public involvement, getting involved at the application process, uh, making sure that the lay summary is um, and, and plain English abstract is actually lay. Of course, people affected by the condition are going to be able to help with that, and that is yeah, that, that's one of the first steps. So if you get help there, it's going to be really helpful moving onward through the project, looking at undertaking and managing, recruiting people, making sure uh, that you retain the, the, the participants that you potentially may need, getting on to disseminating. We've already discussed that, getting people involved in, in what you're going to be saying, who you're going to be saying to it, it to, and how effective that is, implementing, and of course, evaluating the impact of the research. So our aim, when we started working on the patient public involvement program, 
we decided we wanted to support both researchers and people affected by Parkinson's to actively work in partnership at every stage of the research. So we conducted a pilot. We uh, broadcast it to all of the researchers that, that we know. We selected uh, eight research groups and we provided hands-on support to them. Simultaneously, uh, we trained 60 patient and public volunteers across the UK. Uh, we did that face-to-face -face, uh, with 15 to 20 uh, people affected by Parkinson's in every group. And that involved going through the research cycle, explaining what uh, patient public involvement could look like for them and, and, and how to have a voice and to use that voice and to make sure that they felt supported through that, which is really important. So one of the um, research teams that we assisted was uh, the Tracking Parkinson's study, which is the largest ever in-depth study of people affected by Parkinson's, with more than 3,000 people uh, across the UK participating. Uh, and it's aiming to speed up the search for a cure by looking for new biomarkers. And it's led by Donald Grosset, the man smiling there in the picture. And we put together a focus group for him with our trained PPI uh, patient public involvement volunteers. And uh, they commented on the paperwork and processes that Donald had in place. Really interestingly, uh, talking about the ethical issues of genetic testing. Um, the, the data collection methods and, of course, they read through the plain English summary. And it was a successful day. Donald, Donald got a lot out of it. He said, um, as a result, he increased the patient partic uh, participant engagement, made sure that it was really built into the study process and design, making sure that, that, that it wasn't just collecting data, it was a developing relationship and, and, and caring for, basically, the participants, which is so important if you're going to retain them. He also increased the study participant choice regarding how questionnaires are completed because people affected by Parkinson's raise the issue of, you know, not everyone can access it online or, or write effectively. You know, they, they, they pointed out the various ways that, that a, uh, a questionnaire could be distributed. And he included an active linkage of study participants to opportunities for new research studies and clinical trials because, of course, anyone embarking on a clinical trial um, has a vested interest in, in, in changing the face of research. So to let them know about other opportunities is really important. I'm just conscious of time. Um, this is another example. I'll, I'll go through this one. Uh, Catherine Dean was looking at stress and anxiety in Parkinson's and she was applying for funding to, to investigate that. So we put together an online focus group of patients and carers to look at her study protocol and we recruited four patients and carers to be her lay advisory panel. And through their input, Catherine has changed the flexibility of appointments for participants because they've highlighted that, that, that different patients have different needs. And she showed that the frequency of blood samples were acceptable. Again, pay, pay, the, her lay panel were raising the issue of you know, individual needs of patients. And it really helped her to make sure that the patient information sheets were clear and understandable. And that's, that's incredibly important, again, if you're wanting to uh, recruit or retain your patients in your clinical studies. So how do we make patient and public involvement meaningful? We actively support researchers themselves and encourage them to involve people as early as possible in the research process. The earlier that people are involved, the better it is because you're, you're developing that relationship and that can then help you throughout the life of, of uh, a research project, but you're also more likely to succeed at those earlier stages of actually getting your funding. We also support researchers to communicate clearly what is needed. So we've been a little bit of a gateway in, in this first stage. Um, you know, we have this marvelous resource of, of the 3,370 research uh, support network people, we need to make sure that what we're sending to them is understandable and they want to get involved. And then in that process, we're, we're helping researchers make that easier and, and, and to talk about it in ways that, that will be more, most helpful and beneficial for them. And we also support researchers to consider the practical issues of living with the condition. And I would 
say mostly that's 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 the, the volunteers themselves, the patient public involvement volunteers really give that reality check to researchers who just might not I mean sometimes researchers just might not even know people affected by the condition. So to have that reality check is really important. And we also encourage and support researchers to feedback on the impact of the involvement. So if they are involving people in their research, it's so important for them to feedback to those people um, to, to explain what uh, positives and, and potentially negatives, I've never encountered any, but the positives that come out of involving people in their research to, to, to share the ownership of that as well. So our pilot was really successful. We measured the impact of it. That we have um, uh, a resource about this. If anyone's interested, that could be um, circulated after this webinar. But it's had a positive impact on research in that it's improved the written information of the, the researchers that took part, improved the practical design from a patient and carer and family member perspective. Uh, it's help, it's been really helpful for people to comment on the ethical issues raised by the research. So that's important for the patients. It's incredibly important for any researcher who's working in a field that may have ethical concerns, you know, may raise those concerns in the patient community. So to address them with the community first is going to help you when it comes to communicating what it is that you're doing down the line. So an example of that recently we had a focus group with a researcher who is working in stem cell research and we had a really open discussion with patients about their feelings about that and that's going to help her with her next stage of communicating um, with people about the potential uh, clinical trials that she, she might be embarking on down the line. And the impact on the researchers and volunteers has been an increase in confidence and feeling more hopeful about the future and gaining feelings of self-worth and that is both researchers and volunteers. The volunteers of course being able to talk about their condition from their perspective and be recognized as the experts that they are is absolutely fundamentally important. But it's also important for the researchers to, to gain confidence in, in talking to the people who you are working for is, is, is absolutely um, fundamental as well. And yes, recognizing that there are people behind the numbers and graphs. That reality check and, and, and realism is, is really quite moving when you, when you see the, the light bulb moment in, with researchers when they're working with uh, patient public involvement volunteers. And I emphasized the importance of ensuring that research brings clinical benefit to patients. So you know, expressing and, and, and sharing the results of clinical research, even if it hasn't had the uh, outcome that the researcher expected, to share that, to, to, to say what the next steps are going to be, what the potential benefits would be is so important to the, the community of people affected by the condition. So what are we doing now? The pilot was so successful that we are forging on. We have uh, established the Research Partnership Award and this is for uh, researchers uh, working in the field of Parkinson's. Uh, they don't have to be coming to us for funding. They could be seeking funding elsewhere and we provide hands-on support and advice to those researchers who are selected for the award. We fund a first meeting with them and a focus group or a group of um, patient and public involvement volunteers who have been trained and, um, and we help them to plan their next steps as well. So that's where we're at now. There are resources about some of those things that I've spoken about, um, but I think I'm done and ready for any questions if anyone has any. So thanks so much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Anna Louise. Um, that was a really, really useful talk. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's really great to see how you've done so many things that actually like truly listen and involve patients um, and the positive outcomes that that has had. Um, so what I'm going to do now is actually I'm going to ask sort of half an hour, half an hour for questions just open up to um, both Julian and Anna. Um, if you have any questions, please do um, type them into the question box on your control panel and um, they'll come to me and I can ask them to either speaker or both if it's, if, if it's more of a general question. Cool, so our first question that we have, I'll just 
There we go. Um, the first kind of question that we have, and um, this is a question for Anna, is how do you how did you source the lay reviewers, and what tra training did they need? So we source our lay reviewers through our research support network. Uh, anytime we need more or there's an opening, we uh, send out uh, an invitation to the research support network to contact us. And then once they do, we have um, an online training resource that they can use. And we also have been doing annual face-to-face -face, uh, training days where we go around the country and, and uh, We've, we, we put together people and staff members from Parkinson's UK and researchers go through the day with them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then I've got um, another question for Julia. Um, you said that you collected data from 274 patients in one week, um, which is a really great achievement. Um, how did you actually manage to do that? Uh, Julian, I think. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that should work. <laughs> um, well, the um, in order to have you know um, a speed on the way you are capturing data, um, the way we did it is using national organizations because we use the European Federation to ask to the different local organization to disseminate the survey we were running across the different countries. And this, this action really helped us to increase the number of people participating on the survey. And the, the second uh, action we did is really explain why. You know, I guess it's super important when you are asking data to your patients to explain the reason why you are collecting this data and how you're going to use this data. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, another question we've got for um, Anna Louise is um, do the lay grant reviewers meet with researchers or are all discussions virtual? Hi. The lay grant reviewers don't meet with the researchers. The lay grant reviewers receive the plain English uh, abstracts and summaries from the applications. They then comment on that online and send those to us, and they're compiled because it, it could um, it could be a conflict of interest if if the lay grant reviewers are actually meeting the researchers who are submitting the applications. Then the, uh, we have lay grant coordinators who are present at the grant assessment panels and so they're meeting the peers then uh, and they're researchers but they're not the researchers who are applying. So separating out a lay grant reviewer is a patient public involvement volunteer in a way in that they are uh, involved in our processes but our patient and public invol vol involvement volunteers who are working with researchers are not going to be assessing and choosing the, the, the projects that they think should be funded. They're going to be helping those researchers get together their um, potentially their, their, their applications and submitting them. Yeah, So a lay grant reviewer would not be also helping a researcher prepare an application because that would be a conflict of interest. So they're two different roles. Yeah, that makes sense. So cool. Thank you for your answer. Um, I've got another question here for Julia. Um, with the sort of, uh, with the real time kind of data collection that you've been doing, um, what was the online tool that you used, and how did you set it up yourself? Um, we are not we are not using a commercial tool. This is one tool we develop by ourselves. Uh, in the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, we created a technology group some years ago with the goal of providing technology to the Dravet community. Well, and one of the actions we, we did to create this tool uh, from the scratch. So we are not using a commercial tool that you can find online. 
is one tool we we created ad hoc for for Dravet syndrome. Um, volunteers or, or sort of um, um, does it sort of accompany up you pro bono, or, or was it yourself because you're a you're a software engineer yourself? Uh, well, but but it's an easy tool, right? You don't really need sophisticated skills in order to create this kind of tools because the tool is just you know one 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 online tool to collect clinical symptoms and. Um, there are different com available commercial tools that you can use as well, like a small customization on uh, patients like me, you know, and different tools, right? The issue is not really the tool. The tool is simple. The issue is about education and, you know, train people and explain to them the importance of the work they are doing providing the data because the, the tool is not really sophisticated, right? And there are plenty of available tools uh, worldwide in order to collect clinical data. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I've got a question here, which I think is probably relevant to both speakers. Um, did you find it difficult to identify the unmet needs of hard-to-reach communities, and how did you like com com combat it? How did you like identify these unmet needs? And um, we'll probably go to Julian first. Um, the question is about how to identify unmet needs from the from the community. Mm -hmm. um, well, for us is, for, at least for me, is pretty <laughs> straightforward because I have a patient with rabbit syndrome, so mm -hmm. the unmet needs are the needs I have, <laughs> you know, but because of the variability of the patient, it's super important, you know, uh, to do a gap analysis, I guess, from the OU population at the population need. So, I mean, uh, this is a very good question in terms of, I, I don't think too many patient organizations are being intentional doing this gap analysis on what is needed from what they have. Right, so I guess this is a word you guys can do, being intentional, uh, creating some kind of survey or whatever uh, for your community, and ask them what they need and is not covered. Because the if you are working at European level, you can face also differences across different countries. For example, availability of drugs, treatment, medical care, diagnosis. That they can change country by country. So maybe my suggestion would be to do this gap analysis at some point and using the, using the insights from the gap analysis to build your strategic plan. Okay, I guess that's my turn. Um, we, as I uh, explained in the presentation, we, uh, we conducted the James Lind Alliance priority setting partnership and that helped to identify the unmet needs around improving quality of life so that was really helpful in uh, understanding what people wanted other than a search for a cure and better treatments better better drug treatments so that's one way of doing it um, there's another part to that question that Sutton said in that what do you do with those priorities once you identify them so we've experienced a challenge. I mean, I showed you what the top 10 questions or unmet needs were, but they came from over a thousand responses. So we potentially got hundreds of unmet needs and we want to address all of them. Some of them are easier to do by way of research than others. Some of them are already being researched, but uh, some uh, not so much. And, and it could be more an education um, issue or it could be a communication issue about, about treatments that are already available. So what Julian was saying before about you know increasing your knowledge and increasing uh, education about the, the condition is really important and linking those up so 
some of the unmet needs that were identified. We're really pushing the research community to look at I, um, around incontinence and, and Parkinson's and, and long-term health conditions. I, I hosted a, um, a workshop last year with uh, 80 delegates trying to get incontinence and long-term health conditions looked at. And that's been really successful. So there are creative ways that you can do that. But yes, identifying the unmet needs is 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 looking and asking the community what they are, and then what you're going to do about that. You need a plan in place as to how you are going to meet those, especially the ones that are a curveball that you didn't expect. Great, thank you. And and did you find um, that there were some particularly hard to reach sectors of the Parkinson's community um, or have you found that in any of your work and, and maybe how do you sort of sort of overcome that maybe people who aren't on, on, a, on, a, no, aren't online as much and, and that kind of uh, thing. Yeah we, we do I mean we know that there are around 127,000 people in Parkinson's in, in the UK who have Parkinson's uh, and we our membership in the organization is uh, around 40,000 people. So we're missing 87,000 people, potentially. How do we reach those? Well, we have, um, we have local groups of people affected by Parkinson's who uh, meet up, support groups, that sort of thing. So we've got that local reach, and, uh, and, and we need to, to get onto marketing about that, which we do. But in terms of research, uh, as I say, we have around 3,300 uh, in our in our network. I would, of course, like everybody affected by Parkinson's to join up. So again, it's using that local knowledge. So I have um, developed a, a volunteer role, which is research champion, and they are in in areas all throughout the UK, and their role is to to link people in to to broadcast the um, the, the emails that I send about the research support network. We also send paper copies to our research champions so that they can share those in paper form with people in their communities and try to draw people in that way and just to spread the word and to make sure that there is that, um, that connection and that accessibility. But it is, it is a challenge and, and we haven't nailed it yet, but we're, we're, we are really trying. Great, thank you. <coughs> So another question we've got is, have you seen any downsides to patient engagement, such as a patient learning about a new aspect to the disease or a new side effect that scared them? Um, maybe we'll come to Julian first on this one. Mm, it's a good question. Um, I, to be direct, uh, I guess, could be expectations, you know. Uh, from my experience, when you are patient, when you, when you are working with patient community, the expectations from the different uh, patients can be different, especially if they are parents of children, right? Because everybody has their own vision on what is the best strategy to solve the problem of their children. And sometimes this vision collapses with the strategy of the organization. So, if you want to be super supportive with the community and engage them as well in strategic decisions, the issue you maybe can find is try to accommodate expectations from everyone, right? From my experience, this is the most challenging part, and especially for people like me with no, you know, background on enterprise companies and, and business is quite difficult to accommodate the, let's say, the business needs from a patient organization with the personal needs of a community. Yeah, I totally agree with Julian. I mean, I've not had any experience of a patient uh, being shocked by anything they hear about their own condition. They know everything about it. There's, there's nothing you can say to someone who has uh, something like Parkinson's um, that's going to shock them about that. The, the, the issue has been frustration 
um, when, for instance, a patient and public involvement volunteer is working alongside a researcher and they're helping them to um, make sure that their application is as good as it can be and that person doesn't get funded. Yeah, so you need to incorporate in your training for the volunteers to, um, to manage their expectations. And, um, and just because something doesn't succeed in, in getting funded, uh, for instance, uh, the, the research is an incredibly competitive field, that they are still contributing absolutely um, beneficially and, and, um, and to make sure that there are other opportunities for them to get involved as well. So it, yeah, it's definitely around expectations. It's such an emotive um, uh, thing for them to be involved in. You've really got to remember that. This isn't just ticking a box. This isn't just getting people to, you know, back up someone and tick that box and get the funding or whatever. The, the people who are getting involved are doing it because they want their health to be better or their loved one's health to be better. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got a question for Julia. Have you done anything to keep in contact with the 274 people that participated in the Survey Monkey questionnaire? And if so, do you have some kind of platform that you use to keep in contact with this community? Mm, yeah, we did a follow-up with the outcome of the of the survey we conduct in order to explain the importance of the of the work they did. Um, because we collected the, you know, the mail ad uh, address from the people who participated on the on the pool. So one thing that we miss is to be able to put this community, you know, in a in a platform, to be able to reach them in a in a regular basis. And this is this is an an issue with registries that we are facing in the rare disease community. I guess everybody has issues with registries uh, and the, the problem of having you know uh, consolidated registries is not solved so this issue is an extremely important issue because right now I don't think we have an scalable way of being able to uh, be in touch with the people from our community uh, we have some manual registry in Spain for the people working with us but we don't have this view at European level, right? There are issues with privacy of data, um, knowledge management of the information, and this is preventing really the use of this kind of European registries. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I've got um, a question specifically for Anna. Um, have researchers been open to patient engagement or have you faced any difficulty in convincing them to work with patients? Yeah, I mean there is there, there is resistance in some areas. Not resistance because they think it's a bad idea per se, not, not, no one's been brave enough to say that to my face, but um, because they don't understand how they could and I guess particularly if you're looking at things like basic research, fundamental research that doesn't have uh, you know clinical um, engagement built into it and to them I say uh, you still need help with your lay summaries and, uh, and you still need help with your dissemination. So there's always a way to involve them. We tend to be really upbeat about it here. If people uh, are not willing, then they're not going to come to the table. But we do a lot of um, engagement activities with the research community and we, we get great feedback. And also we're, we're being contacted um, uh, weekly by people wanting to, uh, to receive the, the partnership award. Because, as I said in, in my presentation, it's not just us. It's not we're we're not the only funders who are saying you need to do this. So yeah, any resistance that's there is going to be overcome by the fact that they're not going to get funded unless they start doing it. Sorry. <laughs> um, great. Thank you very much. Um, another question um, for you, Anna. 
is um, can you explain a little bit more about the online system that you use? The I'm assuming the online training for volunteers? I think so, yes. Yeah, okay. So anyone who applies to uh, to become a volunteer with us, either uh, lay grant reviewers or patient public involvement volunteers, uh, we've set up on, I think we've used Google Docs. I didn't create it, but I did put input into, uh, into what went into it. But we explained the uh, research pipeline and, and research cycle. Uh, people uh, are given the opportunity to answer questions about that, test themselves, making sure that they understand each stage of that. We then give examples of how they could be involved. We have mock um, uh, lay summaries for them to look at and um, and activities for them to to complete. And then once those are done, we uh, we we have a, a mechanism where they can talk to us individually, and then they're good to go basically. So that took a, that was in a nutshell. That took a lot of work and went through many iterations to make sure it was user friendly. And the reason why we did it, and the reason why it was really important to have that in conjunction with the face-to-face -face, um, training, which of course is always going to be preferable. Face-to-face -face training is much easier. But we have the problem that people affected by Parkinson's, some people have mobility issues. They are completely switched on, they are absolutely engaged, they know more about their condition than, than many you know, experts in the field, but they can't leave their homes. And so we wanted to make sure that they were involved in this and that they are uh, able to contribute just as much as the next person. So that was the reason behind it. And the feedback we've, we've received is that, that people are enjoying it. Uh, and we also use um, uh, teleconference facilities so that people can have the opportunity to have uh, a conversation with us and other volunteers as well. Cool, it's great to hear that it's working out so well. Um, so we haven't um, actually got any more questions but I'll just give people a couple more minutes um, to enter them into the, the little question box if they have any. Um, while you're doing that, I'll just quickly go through some of the other things that we have going on at Find Your Cure for anybody who's interested. So the first is a webinar that's going to be focused on medical guidelines. Medical guidelines are really important in rare diseases because they can provide recommendations to relevant healthcare professionals to ensure that the best care for patients is achieved. The webinar will share case studies of rare disease patient groups who have successfully developed some of their conditions, and we'd love to see you there. And this slide will, all the slides will be available after the um, after the webinar, um, um, probably tomorrow. So um, you don't need to write down the link; it will it will be there um, in the slides. Um, and then um, we have a workshop on Friday, the eighth of September. Um, which will take place at the Royal Society in London. This will focus on working with the with the pharma industry. Um, it will explore the different ways that patient groups can work with, work with industry. Um, uh, the, there are a number of different talks on, on different topics related to this. Um, and if you go to the link in the slide, um, you'll be able to find out more about it. Um, great. Um, I'll just quickly check if we have any more questions? Um, cool. I've got one for um, Julian. Um, you said about how you had a um, you had a strategy in, in the in the graph where you had the four boxes with knowledge on one side and profitable on the other. You had a strategy to get rare disease uh, to get your rare disease into the top right box where it's got lots of knowledge and is a profitable opportunity. Um, how did you come up with that strategy? What what was your strategy? Mm, our our strategy is trying to increase the knowledge about the disease. I mean, we are trying to impact on the vertical age, um, increasing the the knowledge about the community. So the online the tool we saw you uh, collecting. Uh, data from our patients is data that we are offering to the research community in order they can, you know, understand how is the diabetes population and formulate hypotheses that they can contrast with the real data. Because 
the issue for you know for the academia or to the industry where they are jumping into a new condition most of the time is the lack of data so the way we are trying to influence in the in the in the positioning of the interest of Dravet syndrome is increasing the knowledge to make sure the people interested in Dravet is they have the right data in order to move forward with research. Okay, great, that makes sense, thank you. Cool, so we haven't had any more questions and we're actually out of time as well. So um, I'd like to first of all say a huge thank you to um, both of our speakers um, for joining us and sharing our experiences today. Um, just, yeah, really grateful for your help here. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody who joined us as, as an attendant too. You've come up with some great questions, um, and I'm sure I've helped everybody else to, to learn as well from those questions. Um, recordings of the webinar will be sent out um, shortly, probably uh, tomorrow, with a feedback form, and we'd be really grateful if you could fill this in to let us know your thoughts on the webinars, if they should be continued. Um, we, we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, and if you have any more questions following the webinar, please don't hesitate to get in touch. My email is at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter and check out our website. Um, so yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.